Hello, and welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss the interesting facts about each species and debate which one we think is the best. Of course, we think all marine mammals are awesome. This is just our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy this series, and if you want to hear about a particular marine mammal, let us know in the comments. And without further ado, welcome to the Marine Mammal Highlights, our next episode. This week is going to be on porpoises, and we are specifically staying away from the harbor porpoise because We'll do a special one for that one later since that's our study animal. But we want to give some more talk about the other porpoises that get even less information and know people know about than the harbor porpoise. Um, so I'm going to talk about the vaquita and cat. I am going to talk about the spectacled porpoise and Trevor. I'll be talking about the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise. So this is probably going to be one of our shorter, shorter episodes, <laughs> simply because porpoises in general, we don't know a lot about them, which we'll talk about, um, but just a preface for that. Um, so we're going to start with the spectacle, I think, then go finless, yeah. and then I'm going to talk about the vaquita last because uh, there's just some interesting stuff going on with them. Yeah. So do we want to do just really briefly just give a really quick intro to the difference between a porpoise mm. and a dolphin. Also, check out our YouTube video on the difference between a porpoise and a dolphin. But <laughs> in case you don't have time to go do that before you it's watch a short, this, It's a short three minute video. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, just to kind of give people a little intro to how they're different. Yeah. So porpoises generally are smaller. Um, basically, they're kind of like little pigs. <laughs> they're shorter <laughs> and fatter than the longer and sleeker dolphins. Um, and again, generally smaller. So for example, the harbor porpoise is about 150 pounds and a bottomless dolphin is anywhere from 700 to 1200 pounds, something like that. So much, much smaller generally. Um, the main difference that you'll see is that for porpoises, their face doesn't have a, a mouth, a beak or a rostrum as we call it, doesn't come out like a bottomless dolphin does. So the dolphins generally have a little beak whereas porpoises don't. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that rule because there are dolphins that um, have, don't have a, uh, a beak as well, like the orca, but all porpoises have, um, don't have a, a beak. Yeah, blunt face. Um, hmm? Yeah, blunt and face. Um, behaviorally, they're a little bit different. Porpoises are more or likely to be found by themselves in small groups. Um, one or two animals is common. Um, dolphins are generally in larger three to five or up to thousands uh, and just more playful at the surface. Uh, porpoises are generally very shy um, and more evasive. Yeah, really not studied this well too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and uh, the other thing, actually the thing that you'll most likely see is their dorsal fin. So when they come out of the water, the uh, porpoises have a triangular dorsal fin, more shark-like. Uh, and then a dolphin has what we call falcate, which is a more curved um, angle to it. And the there are exceptions to that too, which I will talk about. True. So <laughs> as with almost anything in science, there's always at least one exception <laughs> to any rule that you well, have. I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Kat, go ahead. Yeah. So like I said, I'm going to talk about the spectacled porpoise. Mostly I'm going first because there's, we really don't know anything about this porpoise. So this guy is, um, kind of really odd looking. So it's actually one of the larger porpoise species, um, gets up to about two to two and a quarter meters. So that would be about like, what, like six feet ish. Oh, that's pretty big for. Yeah. yeah. So they're pretty large. Um, they have a really distinct kind of like orca. So they have like a really distinct black top and white belly. And there's a very clear line. That's not like harbor porpoises where that kind of melds from like a dark gray kind of melding into a lighter color. So really distinctive markings, and it's named the spectacle porpoise because it actually has it has black lips. So it's kind of funny looking, actually. It has black lips, and then white rings around its eyes. So hence the name spectacle porpoise. And its Latin name, um, Focina dioptrica. The dioptrica part of that refers to the double eye rings, oh, which is very cool. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the main thing that you'll notice about these guys. They're really really obvious. However, we really don't ever see them. <laughs> which is kind of unfortunate. So um, 
a little bit more about their physiology. Like I said, this is the exception to that sort of triangular fin. So the males, um, they, as they grow older and reach sexual maturity, they actually, their dorsal fins get quite large and rounded. So it's almost more like a, like a pilot whale kind of, like it's very, mm. very kind of just like blunt and round. Um, it has a really wide changing base. with sexual maturity. Mm -hmm. That's weird. Yeah. So there, and it's, it's almost large that like it's disproportionate to their body size. Like it just hmm. kind of looks weird and it has a really wide base when it meets their body. Whereas hmm. the females have a much smaller, more triangular fin typical to, to porpoises. So this is actually one of the only porpoise species that it has a really obvious sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. All right. Well, it's almost like the orcas that have, you know, the very straight triangular giant male dorsal fins oh, yeah. and the females having a more shorter, more curved one, but yeah, still that exactly. isn't as, it's not the same in that it like, it sounds like the porpoise one really changes shape a bit more than- I mean, it, it's not that it necessarily changes shape, it just, it kind of like becomes just expands. Bigger. Yeah. Okay. So, so it, it, is, it, it is, is more like the, Yeah. 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 So it's like, it just grows with them. Um, and also their flippers on their sides are, are kind of quite far forward. So they're just kind of an awkward looking animal. Like they're kind of like a little T-Rex thing, too short. right? I don't know. So like the males, the males are kind of fun. It's like the little flippers are up here and then this huge round like dorsal fin is kind of odd looking. With the little <laughs> Right, with their little spectacles and their black lips. It's kind of adorable. Um, so they were actually briefly considered as their own genus. Um, and then once they actually were able to do some more genetic and morphometric studies, they were once again put back within the Focina grouping okay. because they're pretty odd. <laughs> um, so what we do know about them, they were first described in 1912 uh, when an animal was found on the beach near Buenos Aires. So their, their range they think is kind of circumpolar, so southern hemisphere um, around the kind of Antarctic waters. Basically if you look at one of the maps that are like flattened out, yeah, pretty so much that cool. whole that band. southern band there. So it's off the southern part of South America, they've been seen off um, some of the islands like Tasmania, the Falkland Islands, southern tip of New Zealand, I think they've been seen there periodically. Um, so Buenos Aires, they were found, um, an individual was found there in 1912. Um, very few sightings have been made after that. Those that have really? been made typically, yeah, like typically they're in groups of one to five. So typical to porpoise behavior. Right. Um, they didn't know that there are any information that I could find on them, didn't note that they are fast and active swimmers, but they seem to actively avoid, avoid boats. So when mm -hmm. they are spotted in the wild, they They're will actively away. diverge from the, from the <laughs> boat. Yeah. Like you don't um, see me. Right. It's like, just kidding. Um, food, they don't really know what they eat because they, again, they have very few instances of being able to look at stomach contents, but what they have. Say they haven't were, really, have they, have there been many strandings of them? Yeah, so I mean, uh, not a ton, but they mm. are fairly frequently found stranded off of um, Tierra del Fuego, so that's in okay. South America. Right. So it seems like they're they're actually the second most frequently stranded cetacean in that region. Huh. So although they're not really seen, it seems like there might be more of a density around there because so hmm. many of them seem to strand. seem to strand. Um, there is also a really big gillnet fishery in that area, though, yeah. so it's possible oh. that they are being caught in the gillnets and then porpoises discarded and washing up. Not good. It's a it's a theme. It's, it's definitely a, a theme yeah. with porpoises because they're fairly small. I mean, even this one, which is one of the larger porpoises, it's still small yeah. and it's likely to get um, you know be going after the fish that the fishermen are also hunting. So. Um, there was some evidence for historical hunting of the spectacle porpoise in the Tierra del Fuego region. So like I said, it seems like there is a more consistent population around there, but we just have very few sightings of them alive in the wild to confirm that. Mm -hmm. um, of the people in Antarctica to do said research. I'm if, sorry? They're, if they're polar in the polar region, there's not many people in that polar region in general either for sighting. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of harsh true. waters down there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, yeah, that's a great point. That's, that's very true. And then again, if they are very evasive of boats, they're unlikely to be seen. Um, and they're fast swimmers too. So they can they almost sound wake, that quickly. sounds like a doll's porpoise behavior. Oh, the, the that's what I was thinking when I was thing, reading yeah. it too. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, that's pretty much all we know. They are <laughs> listed as data deficient. They're listed as a species of least concern, basically because we know Absolutely. nothing about them. We don't know enough to say whether we should be concerned about their populations or not. Um, their biggest threats are, from what we know, would be pollution and fishing entanglement. Mm -hmm. um, so the waters that they inhabit, there is, uh, 
increasing concentrations of toxins and runoff and all kinds of nasty stuff that we chuck out because we figure no one lives there so we can do it here right so all right um, so from what we know, those are the two major threats, but like I said, they're kind of an enigma. We really don't know anything about them. Um, yeah. I think it's kind of cool that they're like this enigma that we don't know anything about and they have, they're so weird looking and cool. I so know. it's like, they're just like this. Whoa. Well, that was why I picked it. Cause I've always been fascinated by them. Like ever since I first started looking at cetaceans in a book when I was like eight, I was like, Whoa, they're so cool. And I was like, Oh, we know nothing. Oh. <laughs> and we still know nothing. It's like three right. years later. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you'd think right. with a dorsal fin like that, for at least the male with a dorsal fin like that and their coloration, they're not going to be super obvious, but you'd think they'd be visible, like perhaps more visible than say a harpa porpoise with a little right. fin that's like that high. Right. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So that is a spectacle porpoise, the enigma of the cetacean world. That's right. <laughs> like as, as porpoises generally are, and then they're like they're like the most extreme. Like, right, right. right. So that's kind of why I porpoise. wanted to start with them, whereas like this is kind of where we are with a lot of porpoises to some degree or other. Like we really don't know anything about them. It's true. I actually so I just posted something on, on Facebook, um, but it's one of those memes and it has a a, a, a guy and he's carrying a dog. And it says, is it a cetacean researcher? And oh, it has, the dog one. is whales and dolphins. And then behind it is the cat going like, oh, porpoises. and the cat is porpoises. porpoises. Yeah, porpoises. <laughs> it's like, so true, except for yes. us, because we love porpoises. Yes. <laughs> but that's true. I mean, porpoises just generally get forgotten. And that's why yeah. we don't know much about them. Yeah. So moving on to another yeah. one we don't probably know much about. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, so yeah, the Indo-Pacific finless porpoise is also has its key difference, kind of like your giant dorsal fin, mine has no dorsal fin. Um, <laughs> finless? Yeah, finless. And until recently, there was only one species of finless porpoise, until they decided to split it into two different species of the Indo-Pacific finless, which I'll talk about, and the narrow ridge finless porpoise, which pretty much look exactly the same. But there's a It's interesting that one of them has a name as regarding its morphology, and the other one has a name with its geography. Oh, like I would have figured yeah. they would have just been like, this is the Indo-Pacific and this is where this other guy is found. So that's kind of funny. They think they split, so I can't, I didn't find the exact year when they made it a different species, but they think the two split when land bridge was formed between Tasmania and China. Oh, okay. And so that genetically separated the two species. Right. Interesting. As, as happens. Mm -hmm. Right. So, the narrow ridge is just in a very small region north of Taiwan, essentially. Okay. And then the Indo-Pacific is basically from Taiwan all the way to the Persian Gulf on the west side of India. Wow. Okay. That's so a pretty big range. I didn't realize. I know. Yeah, so there, there wasn't really equal distribution. <laughs> a little bit. Hold on. And they really only stick to the coast, too. Like, they've only rarely been seen off the coast, like miles and miles off the coast. But hmm. that was in shallow water as well. So those, they really sense. only stick to shallow water, probably because of food and such, but. Right. There's a, a lot of porpoises do. There's a couple that are right. deeper water, but. But the cool thing about these guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, I think they're the only porpoise with tubercles on their back. I'm sure are, porpoises having tubercles, so probably. <laughs> basically imagine a wart with a hair in it. Yeah. It's like a sensory function, they think. Oh, I was just reading about that. We wrote a paper about that, didn't we, Kat? Yeah, I, I think they're actually, I think it's something that all, all of them have vestigially, but I think there's very few that actually still have it visible. Yeah, I, and I, I think. It. Yeah. So that was That's one of the really differences cool. between the two, was just the distribution of the tubercles. Oh, the, wow. The Pacific had a very wide, like up to 11 centimeters wide patch of tubercles, and then that kind of went down the longest back, versus the narrow ridge had a very narrow patch of tubercles. So that's right. kind of how you can quickly figure out between the two. Huh. That's so cool. But yeah, I mean, I never heard of a porpoise or dolphin and, having that on this back. Yeah, and I remember, I just can't remember from the paper that they, like, we basically know, like, it is sensory, but we don't know really exactly what, what it for. does. Or, like, why. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so Very that was kind of cool. interesting. Um, but yeah, other, other than that, for differences wise, the skull is just a slightly different. Mm -hmm. The narrow ridge porpoise has a narrow rostrum and longer, versus the Indo Pacific has a much shorter, more blunt, well, not much, but a little 
a little shorter and more blunt face than the other one. Right. But really, if you just looked at the two quickly, you couldn't really tell. Gotcha. But there's that. It's like really? fraternal twins that like look really close, but they're yeah, just slightly exactly. different, but you're just not sure. And as for the finless portion, the endo has like a concave back, oh, which wow. then kind of goes up to a ridged portion in the peduncle, which is just okay. above the middle. And then the narrow ridge has more of just a ridge. Oh, it's more it's kind of a line. So it almost looks like the Indo Pacific, they scooped the dorsal fin out. I was <laughs> just thinking that. that. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, they look oh, completely the same, but I mean, to a certain degree, until you look at the nitty gritty stuff and once right. you start changing those and looking at genetics, they finally decided they're different species. Mm. Right. Yeah, and I remember that that's happening not that far in the past that because there, there was like six corpus species and then right and now, now there's seven seven yeah. and then there's those species of those species so right right no yeah right. we're not even talking about the that's seven super species. cool though <laughs> yeah that's so interesting cool. how interesting i'll stick with the endo for the most part because that's what they know more about um they think it's vulnerable not quite endangered as mm -hmm. opposed to the narrow ridge because there's so few they are worried about extinction sure but they can get fairly large. I think the largest specimen they found was seven and a half feet. Whoa! Wow. Yeah, but generally they're about five feet. Right. Okay. And then they have really large flippers too for porpoises. Not, not not quite like a humpback as long as that, but they have really long. Just I think I said twenty five percent of the length of their body they can be. Oh. Wow! So it's well, function wide steering and. Yeah, you know it, what, that kind of tends to be a thing in cetaceans where if you have like you look at the bottomnose dolphins, the ones that are in shallow waters that are going to have to maneuver around things have mm. fairly larger pectoral fins. And then the ones in offshore waters are much smaller to be more streamlined. So, yeah. and it happens in fish as well. The one, if you think about fish that are in the racing along oh, in the yeah. deeper ocean versus ones that are in a, in a coral reef system, right. they're going to have these bigger fins that they can maneuver around rather than just cleaning out. Oh, yeah, these guys will stick not very far off the coast at all. So that's what kind of way we've seen a fair amount of them because they're right. also one of the most densely populated areas in the world. Mm -hmm. And they're only off the coast or near the coast up to like 160 feet, I think it was, was their pretty much limit. Oh, and that's wow. just because that's where their food is. Right, just right. crabs on the bottom or sandy bottom fish or stuff like that. Gotcha. But yeah, they're not in huge pods like a typical porpoise or not, typically like other porpoises, they're not in a huge pod. Right. They're in like groups of one to three. But there's not a whole lot we know about them because <laughs> <laughs> so the theme of today, bottom <laughs> fish, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's but really I know interesting. Some of the narrow ridge are in some. I think there's a couple in a couple Chinese aquariums, so they can kind of study them there. Okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. Rides. Yeah, like that's an problems. interesting interesting point that if some of them can live in, in captivity because basically there aren't porpoises in captivity because they're so sensitive that they just don't handle it well. There's a couple of harbor porpoises up in Vancouver, um, but generally they don't yeah, they don't really they're not guys. they're not hardy like bottomless dolphins are, which is why yeah. there's so many of those in the aquariums because they can handle it basically. I couldn't find any evidence of anyone holding the Indo-Pacific in an aquarium, but they did have the narrow ridge. The narrow ridge, oh, interesting. I don't yeah. know if that was because they're more vulnerable and therefore want to protect the species or this. That's probably, that's probably Indo, let's just grab it, you know? I don't know. Right. <laughs> it's also possibly how easy they were to capture too. Yeah. I mean, if the, if the narrow ridged are in a smaller system, they might be a little bit easier to corral, I don't know, versus they do, the Indo-Pacific. They will go up the Yangtze River. Okay. So there's that too. Yeah, which is not good. Because no. <laughs> that's where the Yangtze River dolphin has become functionally extinct because of pollution, people, and, pollution and, and construction and just bad management of waterways. So it's not really the greatest river to go to. I guess we'll end it on the fact that they believe the dorsal ridge that's replacing the fin essentially mm -hmm. is homologous to the two species in his uh, special doll cetaceans or dolphins. So they have, you know, the finless whales too, but they think this is homologous just to the. Oh, to the, so they or, developed it separately. Right. Interesting. And they so do those are some 
good reason for it. I mean, it's it's a kind of an odd thing, right? So almost all cetaceans have dorsal fins, and that's usually for stability right. in the water and being able to, you know, maneuver and stuff. They, one explanation was they're one of the most, ba they think the Indo-Pacific is the most basal of the porpoises. Oh, and that's interesting. The other porpoises then developed fins. Like oh, open interesting. Yeah. So they mm -hmm. started off without a dorsal fin, which I guess right. makes sense because they came from land mammals. Yeah, exactly. So you would start off with not having one of those things, and then somebody started getting bumps on their back, and then I was like, oh, that's actually really helpful. That's interesting. And then I, right. And then I wonder if that would also then tie in with why they still have the visible tubercules or tubercules, yeah. however you say that. Um, uh, because they, they originally, potentially. Area, those range from like just literal lumps to actually like spines, it seems like. Yeah. yeah. So there's so a lot cool. of variability in the width and, you know, the width and length of the patches are so different. It's, there's a whole lot of variability. So it's hard to, that's hard to distinguish species for that reason. And it's been a whole debate of whether to have six or seven corporate species right right well that's the thing is is anytime um you have genetics yeah. <laughs> genetics has been great um but also makes it very confusing as to how where we should delineate whether it's a species or not so there's always debate um i mean you look at the bottomless dolphins you have terceps truncatus terceps aduncus for the longest time they wouldn't say that it was a second species and you know right very crazy. cool yeah. i did not know anything about those guys i didn't I either I, the only thing i remember now is only because he mentioned it was like oh wait i read something about those tubercles <laughs> right a while ago right. so um so now we're going to talk about the vaquita and i will warn you now that it is not a happy ending <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately um it could be still but right now it's not looking so great so the vaquita is uh, its special thing is it is the smallest cetacean in the world um, out of any whale, dolphin, or porpoise. Um, vaquita means little cow in Spanish. Oh, that's so, so cute. I know. Like, it's just adorable. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so again, they're small. So again, the harbor porpoise is the second smallest cetacean, and that one is, at, is five to five and a half feet. These guys are four to five feet, 65 to 120 pounds. <laughs> just so little. <laughs> Um, they have a, what they think is about a 20-year lifespan. Um, females are actually longer than males, but males have larger how fins. long they live? Uh, no, the sorry, they're, they're size. The, their okay. size, yeah. So gotcha. females are longer. They're sexually dimorphic um, to some degree. Um, but at the, fail, the males have actually have larger fins, which is, <laughs> again, kind of like the orcas, interestingly. Right. Um, it's kind of like the spectacle porpoise. They have markings around their eyes and lips. So they have these black patches around their eyes and then like lipstick which makes them super cute. Um, and this is what's interesting. They are, the <clears throat> they are the only porpoise species that's found in warm water. Because if you think about all the porpoise species are cold to polar waters. Right. Um, so they have a tall dorsal fin, a tall and wide dorsal fin. Um, and it's still triangular shaped like other porpoises. But what they think that is there for <clears throat> is to help reduce the body temperature in the water. So when there comes up is more surface area to uh, regulate lose heat yeah yeah so there's a reason wow. for it um they we know a little bit uh, more about them they reach sexual maturity at three to six gestation is about 10 to 11 months um and they they think that females give birth every other year like many purpose species um however uh, it's either every year or every other year for purposes basically um and they're thought to do it every other year but with a study that was recently done which we'll talk about in a little bit um they found that it actually may be every year, which would good since their populations are so bad right now. Yeah. Um, so they, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save the, the why everything's bad for the end here. <laughs> um, behaviorally, they, they're found alone or in pairs. They're shy, they avoid boats. Again, same old, same old for the porpoises. Um, so they're difficult to observe, which is why we don't know much about most of the porpoises. Um, they feed on small fish, crustaceans, and cephalopods. Um, a lot of what we know comes from stranded animals. Um, and so recently they did do a photo ID study. So um, taking photographs and tracking them over time to try to find out what's going on with these populations, how many individuals there actually are. Um, so to get an estimate of abundance and learn about life history. And that's where they noted that they may actually calve annually. Um, so that's basically what we, and in the habitat, we've, they're in shallow waters up to 50 meters, so 150-ish feet. 
um, and they're only found in the northern Gulf of California in, in Mexico, uh, also known as the Sea of Cortez. So it's this tiny, it's not even the whole thing. It's like this tiny, like right in the armpit <laughs> of where that comes down in Mexico. Um, they're just in that little tiny spot right there. So uh, if anything's happening there, it, it, it's a bad for them because they, they don't have anywhere else to go. Um, they prefer turbid waters, so stuff that's, um, you know, currents are going in and out and causing the water to be uh, bubbly. Um, they have the smallest geographical range of any marine mammal, um, hmm. and most of their life is spent within 1,519 square mile area, which is a quarter of the size of the metropolitan LA, which is the wow. thing huh. it is. So, so they're the smallest cetacean, <laughs> they have the smallest geographical range, um, so it, they're pretty unique in that, and they're only the only ones found in warm waters. Yeah. So that's what we know about these guys, um, and they're super cute. What we also know is that they are the most endangered marine mammal, and it is estimated that there are roughly about 10 to 15 that remain in the wild, definitely less than 20. Which is insane, if you insane, think about that. Right. Like it's compared to, you know. Part, really. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, I don't know when they, you know, there's a, the term functionally extinct, which the Yangtze River dolphin has is, and that's basically there's not enough animals left to create a viable population. So it's just a matter of time before they actually go extinct. Um, so we, I'm not sure when they when they just they will say that they're functionally extinct. Um, I don't know, but it, they're getting close. Yeah. So um, a little bit of history with this. The um, basically the problem is is Tuatava. And I don't know if I said that right. Mm -hmm. Totoaba. It's T O T O. I think it's Totoaba. Totoaba. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a big fish. It's like six foot, two hundred pounds. Um, that they're fishing for, and with gill nets, and the vaquita get caught in it um, as bycatch. So um, the history of it is there is a International Committee for the Recovery of the Vaquita, or CIRVA, C I R V A, which is the Spanish acronym. They were created, and they we're trying to find basically how to pr help protect these um, porpoises. In 2012, there was estimated to be 200. By 2014, there were fewer than 100, and less than 25 of those were reproductively uh, mature females. So there was basically a 90% decline between 2011 and 2016 in their population. Oh. So just huge, just crash. Um, in 2016, acoustic monitoring revealed that the uh, vaquita, uh, most of them were lost between 2015 and 2016, the remaining of those, so another 50% decline. I mean, it's just, you know, crashing super hard. Um, and as of March 2019, there were no more than 22 remaining, and they think it's probably less than that. Mm -hmm. So it was a 95% yeah. decrease since 1997. So not good. Um, so basically, it's uh, the Tuataba fishery is illegal. Um, it is an endangered fish as well. Um, but what they're fishing for, which is crazy, is the swim bladder. So the bladder that fills with air or gets air out to be able to ha help the fish regulate where it is in the water column. The, the, um, the swim bladder is uh, sold in China, basically. Um, they, it is thought that they're, it's used in traditional medicines, um, and some think that they can cure ailments like arthritis. They make soups that may ease the discomfort of pregnancy and cure joint pain. Um, so it's basically, they're, they're, th that market is what's keeping this going. <clears throat> um, they even, I thought this was really interesting. I didn't know this. They even use, um, use them as speculative investments or assets. They call them cash bladders. So wow. when wealthy people are like, oh, the market might be crashing or something, they hoard these swim bladders. And then they wow. can sell like, them. Like gold bars almost yeah, in the back exactly. of the day. Yeah. Wow. That's and fascinating. then they sell them when times are tough or whatever, and they can sell them for a lot because people, it's a, it's a thing. Um, there is a, a species of yellow croaker in China um, that is now on the brink of extinction for the same reason the Tuataba and the Vaquita are, because they basically mm -hmm. wiped out that fish here, which is, again, large and has a big swim bladder. Um, and now they're moving on to the ones in Mexico. Um, <clears throat> so talking about the cash, one, one kilogram of swim bladder, because they dry it out um, before sending across, $8,500 for one, for, for a kilogram of swim bladder. So this is obviously why that fishery is still in existence, even though it's illegal. Right. Yeah. 
Because catching one of those means the same as three to four months of work for a Mexican fisherman. Wow. So it's one of those things where it's hard where you're like, well, you know, it's terrible. You shouldn't do that. But um, it's, it, it's the, the money is really, really good. Like you can kind of can't blame them in some regard because they're, they don't have a lot of money to begin with. Um, so it's a really hard thing that that's going to continue to be a problem um, unless something happens. Mm -hmm. And um, the Mexican government has taken steps. They put a two-year ban on gillnets in 2015. In 20, 2004, they created a refuge for the vaquita. Um, in 2017, um, the 2015, the, the two, it was a two-year ban of gillnets, and they paid fishermen for their loss of money for not using them. And then 2017, they banned all gillnets, uh, except for a couple species, because they use gillnets for a lot of different um, fishes out there. Right. Um, and banned on night fishing to aid in catching poachers, but it's the money. Illegal, it, you know, it's illegal fishing. Um, the reason why the gill nets are such a problem for uh, the vaquita is that the the mesh that is used for the toataba, because it is such a large fish, the, the mesh is the perfect size for a vaquita head. Hmm. So all gill nets are bad, as we talked about with the porpoises. But the toy tub one specifically because they just they get stuck in it and then they 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 will drown in, in a matter of minutes. Um, so because of the gill nets are used for many other fish, when before the gill nets were banned, and you know I don't know how well the Mexican government is is doing in uh, controlling who's using what, um, but there were 435 miles of gill nets that were set within the vaquita habitat every day. Wow. And remember that they're only in 1,500 square miles of of waters so it's right. so that's it's a maze of their territory yeah pretty much so you know how do they um how do you yeah. yeah and you know the in the in the um illegal trade is not just it's not just china that's a problem you know u.s a lot of it's being smuggled through the u.s right and it's through other countries so it really needs everybody to be on the same page of really cracking down and not letting it through. Um, I was reading one story where they had um, some Chinese nationals were had you know put them in their suitcases and put them around stuff, and they had like three hundred swim bladders, something ridiculous. Oh, so it again, was, you think about the cash value of that oh, one suitcase load is millions. millions. Yeah, yeah, millions of dollars. Yeah. So, um, and that's what the really thing with with any of these illegal trades and you know the ivory, you know, with with elephants and things like that, it all comes down to there's a market for it and it's a lot of money. People are going to do it. Yeah. So, um, it's a matter of of figuring that out. But it's been a, in in Chinese culture, it's a thing that they've done for centuries. Um, is using these in more traditional medicines and traditional things. So it's a, a cultural thing as well, which um, is a little bit harder to you know, change people's minds on, minds on if it works or not. Right. Um, so they did, uh, one last thing before we kind of close up is that the, um, they did attempt a couple of years ago, they had a whole bunch of uh, different um, uh, marine mammal researchers and porpoise researchers go down to Mexico, take boats out, and they tried to capture the vaquita in order to um, have them in human care so that they could make sure that they stay alive and can continue um, hopefully you know breed and put more out there like we've done with other species mm -hmm. but unfortunately the vaquita as I talked about before with porpoises that they're kind of fragile and they don't do well in captivity basically one I know died like the the it was a female and she just freaked out I believe it was a female um, and she died and another they, one they had a heart attack and died right and then another one was getting really, really stressed, so they let it go. And I don't know if they know the fate of that um, that that animal. But basically, after that, they're like, "Well, this isn't going to work because if you kill just one of them, <laughs> you're reducing it by quite a big percentage since there's right. not that many." So conservation action now is focused on enforcement, trying to get the Mexican government um, to be able to really enforce the rules that they're putting out there, which they have been doing. Yeah, a good job of of trying and putting that stuff out, but really, if you can't enforce it, it's not going to do anything. Um, looking at alternative gear development uh, so that you can give something else to the fishermen besides gill nets to catch them, uh, to catch the uh, fish that they want, um, and specifically looking at times during the Tuatapa spawning season because that's basically when they um, when they come out. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but that's a good point. I mean, it is one of those things where I think we tend to immediately assume that 
nothing's being done about it in the in the country where this is a problem. And that is the thing, like the Mexican government was really strongly behind the efforts to, yeah, you know, help to save the vaquita. And there was a big push um, from the Mexican government at that time. And it just, like you said, I mean, that's the problem with an illegal fishery. It's not, it's not worth the fishermen stopping to do stop. it functionally for their families. They can't afford to feed their families. And also there is, there's several really good documentaries about the vaquita too, if you're interested. Um, but it seems like it also kind of almost becomes a little bit like a like a gang situation where when you try to get out, your family is then actually physically in danger from other people who will hurt you to keep themselves safe right. from authorities. So it, it's not just about the money. It also becomes like the, the safety of your family could also be at risk at some point. Because the other ones that, you know, other don't, people don't want to try to stop it, don't want you to try to stop it. So, right. So that's the thing, just to make people aware, like it, it's a huge mm -hmm. risk for these fishermen to not do this fishery if they're already right. in it. And there's a lot of pressure to be in it. So it's it's a really difficult situation it, for everybody. It's a complicated conservation issue. It's a, comp a, a complicated uh, political issue. It's a complicated yeah. human issue. Um, a lot of time left. Yeah, and they, yeah. We, they don't. I mean, they're with 10 to 15, I, I honestly don't know if they could really create a viable population that wouldn't have genetic issues down the line from this few right. of the animals. But um, it's people still believe that we could still try to save them. So we should we should try. We should see if we can and, and, and see what happens. But um, Viva Vaquita is also a really good place if you want to learn more about them. Um, it's a, one that's a researchers within the uh, Society for Marine Mammalogy and they mm -hmm. um, uh, have a place where you can buy stuff to, to, to uh, put to get money to go towards helping protect the species. Um, yeah. We got at the one of the conferences. We got a, a vaquita ball, and it's a little ball with a vaquita face on it. It's, it's super cute. Super cute. <laughs> so you can get one of that for your for your kids if you want, and that money goes to help um, figuring out how to uh, help to save these guys. So we'll put some of those links down below for yeah. you guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, and share everybody with what you know that we know. Uh, there's quite a few people that we know that you don't know about the vaquita. Um, and we don't want them becoming the Yangtze River dolphin that is functionally extinct. Um, but we may end up seeing that in the near future if nothing changes. So, yeah, um, that's our sad ending to the, the porpoise stories. I mean, the one thing I would say, like to make it not be quite such a depressing end, because it is, mm -hmm. but the one thing about that is going back to what you were saying earlier, that part of the reason that we know how endangered this population actually is, is through photo ID. Right. So shameless plug for photo ID, like that is the way that we can actually understand a population of animals. Because if you're just seeing animals swimming around, you're like, oh, there's plenty of them. We see them all the time. No, you that's the, be same seeing the same five animals all the time. And there's only right. five. So that's, the, you know, that is the thing is, is it's due to people actually going down there and, and taking the time to study those animals and monitor them that we even found out that they were in such a delicate position as they are. Right. So I, you know, it's it's obviously it's dire for them, but it doesn't have to be that way for other porpoise species or other species of cetacean in general. Yeah, and I just did a, a survey for a conservation um, thing, and they're basically saying like, what do you think is the most important for conservation? And one of the answers that you could give is research. Right. If we, you, in order to conserve a species, in order to know how to protect them, you cannot do it unless you know what the species is. You know where they go. You know what, how long they live. You know how often they reproduce. All those things right. are really important. You know how many there are? <laughs> right. How many there are? And the individuals there are, their social structure even, and how they interact with one another and other species to determine what is the best course of action. So yeah. if you don't have that research any conservation efforts you have are, are probably not going to be as good as they could be. Um, yeah. so. so, I mean, just, you know, that, that isn't necessarily, you know, going to uplift everybody, but I feel like at least, at least we can do something to right. protect these guys for as long as we can and then other species as well. Right. And so, and that's really the main thing is if, if we can't save these guys, it, they should be, uh, you know, it a, has a to be a lesson, right. A lesson yeah. in yeah. how not to have this happen again. Yeah. For exactly. sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed our porpoises with the less amount of information that we know about these guys. Um, <laughs> but that's, again, what we're trying to do is, you know, we, we similarly know li little about harbor porpoises. We know a little bit more about them than other species. Um, but that's what we're trying to change here at PacMam. So um, trying to learn more about these underrepresented 
species in the cetacean world. Um, and that's about it. So uh, I don't know what show we'll, we'll do next week, but we'll have some fun marine mammals for you to, to learn about. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, as always, if you guys have any suggestions for that, please let us know social media, Instagram, Facebook, in the comments, whatever you want. But yeah, we'd love to talk about what you guys want to hear about too. So let us know. Yeah. Let us know. We'd be happy to do it because we love to geek out over marine mammals. Yep. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time. All righty. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Each species we discuss has their own write up in our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks. <laughs>